Hi, Lynn Gilliland here, Lessons from Leaders. And in this episode, we're with Emily Pryor, who's the CEO of Data2x, which is a crazy name, and she talks about it. And it is one, an episode that's, that really sums up 2021 into one big package. Emily and I had to reschedule several times. One first time because COVID, she, had young, she has young kids at home. And the second time, the crazy winter storms in Tennessee. So we finally got around to it and we had so much to dive into. In this episode, I want you to look out for three things. One, what it means to be a social entrepreneur. And Emily has a lot of background in that, the importance of flexibility and adapting, which we have been practicing this last year, and how to see your team as individuals to build team culture and tone. It is a really excellent episode. I am so happy to introduce you to Emily. So let's get to it. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, obviously I am Lynn Gilliland here with Emily Pryor. And um, we are so happy to have you here, Emily, because, well, for many reasons, because we want to know what, what you're doing and some of the innovative things that you are working on. And also because we uh, have been working to get you here to be with us since April of 2020. Um, just so the listeners know, uh, Emily has two small children at home. So when we reached out to her in April or May, obviously it was she was just getting her feet on the ground of working at home with two small kids. And um, so finally, we found a time to meet. So Emily, welcome to Lessons for Leaders. Lynn, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and have this conversation with you. And thanks for your patience and connecting with me. I feel like one of the important things that, that I've had to learn how to be comfortable with as a leader and as a working parent is when you have to say that you need a minute. And in this case, it was, I need 12 months <laughs> to uh, get, get my feet under me um, in various ways. Uh, so I appreciate the patience and I'm so happy we're having this conversation. And you're welcome. And as we know, at so much, you and I were just talking about the New York Times article about women, working women, women leaders who have children at home. So the fact that you even said yes at all is I am grateful for. And so to start with, why don't you tell us um, about you are leading and uh, data to data to X, a very odd name. And it's, it has an interesting history. So I why don't you give us how you how you came to be leading this this effort? Absolutely. So Data 2X is it's been very exciting to to get to lead and build this organization over the last few years. It actually came into being from uh, an observation and a desire by a policymaker who was Secretary of State at the time, Secretary Hillary Clinton. And she was in a situation of being a long-term advocate on behalf of women and girls here in the U.S. as well as all around the world. And obviously, as a Secretary of State, in a position to need to not only set policy for the State Department, but also to give the president the best advice, right? And she was in a position where when it came to women and girls, she was unable to do so. And the reason for that is because the decisions and recommendations that she made and that the team at the State Department wanted to make they wanted those decisions to be backed by information and to be based in the data that was collected um, in order to, to make recommendations. And what they discovered was that that data really didn't exist on women and girls and that we had a couple of different problems when it came to that type of data. Either that data didn't exist at all or the data that was there was skewed and biased in some way uh, because of the way that it was, was collected. And so... The team at the State Department uh, took, took on the task of saying, well, what could we do about that? And um, they decided that it was really time for there to be a concerted effort on, on this issue. And so they um, decided to, to take this on, got some initial um, startup capital from the Hewlett Foundation and announced the creation uh, of, of this initiative called Data2x. And um, I love that story because I, I think, first of all, 
the reason why data is important is not just to have data for the sake of data. Data is important because it should be guiding policy. And so I love that story because it's about demand, right? The demand and the need for data to shape policy rather than just you know, having it for, for the sake of itself. And so, um, you know, it was a really amazing opportunity because the State Department um, was not going to, you know, it wasn't going to be a, a program of the United States government, but they really saw that there was a need for an independent organization to exist to to try this out and to see what could be done. And I was really lucky um, to, to, to be in a place where I had uh, just started a few years earlier, a women's economic empowerment program and was in the position to, um, you know, have the opportunity to take this on. And they said, you know, what could you do with this, with this idea of, of Data 2X? And it's really been such an honor and a privilege um, for myself as a leader, but also the opportunity to draw a lot of really great people together to take what was a policy speech and turn it into an organization and a movement for increasing gender data, increasing and improving the kind of data we have about women and girls to improve policymaking. Um, I think the last thing I'll say, because you, you raised it in terms of the name, you were like, that's kind of a weird name. And it is kind of, it's kind of a different name um, and a different sounding name, which I actually love um, uh, because I think it gets people's attention of, well, what is that? What does that mean? And really what it was about was, uh, and the inspiration behind it was that women and girls have a multiplicative power in their communities for good. Mm -hmm. And so that's why uh, that came in was this idea of, you know, if you're investing in women and girls, you're, you know, really doubling, some could say tripling, quadrupling <laughs> the impact that you can have on communities. So that's why it's named Data 2X. And I love that. So I'm glad that you, you told us why. I love that it's quadrupling, tripling, hundredfolding, however you say <laughs> um, When I looked at your, at your bio, you are, and I was telling you this earlier, in my mind, you're a social entrepreneur. You've started or been at the beginning of several things, of several um, enterprises so and movements. And I also like that you called it start leading an organization or movement. I, I like that you put those together. So what, what do you... What is it in you that what that, that you think, oh, I can do this, or how does that happen, that you are someone who keeps like, okay, let's do this? Um, I think that what's behind that is that I am genuinely curious mm. about the world of how it works and about the people who make things move. And so that's led to me being really interested in trying to figure out, you know, how to put pieces together, to put, to put pieces together, to put people together, to try to solve problems, because I'm curious about how it can be improved. And I also have a lot of curiosity about areas that are new. Like I remember at the time um, when we were starting Girl Up, um, and even actually before that, what led to the creation of Girl Up was a real investment in the space of adolescent girls. This was um, in the kind of early 2000s, which, which actually was, was evidence-based. It was through some great work, great research work that was going on, um, especially by ICRW and the Population Council. It was really identifying that in our focus on children and our focus on young people, that there was a group of, of people who were particularly vulnerable who were being systematically left out, and that was adolescent girls. And so that was an example of, oh my goodness, there's this thing that's been in our face kind of the whole time, and there hasn't been a lot of action on it. So what are all of the creative things that we can do to address it, right? So, so there's that um, idea of, of how do you take something new and start building um, uh, new programs and, and new movements really to address it. And then I think in the case of, of gender data, you know, kind of similarly, gender data is something that when we got started in 2014, 
it wasn't new. It wasn't an unknown issue, particularly in certain communities, um, in statistical communities and technical communities. There was a knowledge of gender statistics and that there were gaps in those statistics and certainly wonderful people who were working on that. But it hadn't yet broken through outside of those technical communities to really having policy communities, as well as just the general public, engage with that issue more and decide and see how it was relevant to them. And, and I think that opportunity to try to better communicate the deep relevance of something to people's lives that seems that seems like it could be too remote or too technical or whatever, that, that there is actually a relationship and a, and a concrete impact that that can make on lives. I look at that as I'm curious about how to do that well. And I look at it as a really exciting, creative opportunity um, to, to make something new happen. So there's like the curiosity that you think, oh, let's, let's think about this. How could this happen? How can we bring these pieces together? And, um, and the, then, then there's the, some probably liking innovation. Like that's, I don't know if you've used those words, but that what comes across. And then the part you haven't talked about is like, I could do this, or we could do this, <laughs> or why not? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a why not situation. Mm. I mean, I'll, I'll say, you know, in, in having, as I've said, kind of the honor and privilege of getting to, to take Data 2X from a speech to, to an organization and a movement, I didn't go into this knowing that that was what I was going to do. You know, my background is not in statistics or data science. My background is actually in public health, but I've, I've worked in a lot of different, um, as you noted, I've worked on a lot of different things over my mm -hmm. career, which I think is because of curiosity and just interest in so many things. Um, and so, but I approached it from a, well, you know, why not me? It, this hasn't been figured out yet and and not to assume that you know we have all the answers because we certainly don't but i've 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 always felt like if something continues and persists in being a problem why not give it a try you know mm -hmm. if you have the opportunity and you have the energy because <laughs> it takes a lot of energy um and you have the opportunity and you're able to gather the right people around you, and that is essential, um, it, then, then, then why not give it a try? Um, and I think it's just, I think it's just been something that's been a part of me. I, I think it's sort of innate, like a, a why not feeling and, um, and, a, and a desire to raise my hand and try. It's like I'm seeing like the ingredients. Why not give it a try? And there's the opportunity, the right people, and um, you know, and 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 a, and, a, and a purpose for doing it. It seems like you have a strong, a very strong driving purpose. Absolutely. And energy. I didn't say energy, but that obviously takes a lot of energy. <laughs> it definitely does. So, what have you learned about leading these? As, these types of initiatives, like what does what kind of leadership does that take? either what you have already or what you also wish that you had more of? Mm. I think that it, it requires, yes, certainly a lot of energy. Um, it requires a willingness to be flexible and adaptable, mm. you know, always. I think especially when you're starting something new, when you're really charting charting a new, a new field as, as, well, it's not really a new field in terms of gender data. As I said, there's been a lot of work on it, particularly in technical communities over the last few decades, really, but, but starting a new way of looking at it and, and dealing with it. And, and there wasn't a roadmap, right? There weren't other organizations doing the same things that we were doing. So that means some things are going to work and some things are not going to work. And you need to have the ability to be nimble and flexible and adaptable. Um, so I would say all of those things are really necessary ingredients. I would also say, um, and this is really core for me as a leader, I think it requires a great deal of empathy. And it's, that's such an important um, quality to me and, and something that I really value and that I have found indispensable as a leader 
some of it is that I can't help it, right? I think it is just truly a personality trait <laughs> that, that I have. Uh, I would observe it. I think sometimes it makes things hard um, or can make things harder on me because I'll experience, you know, part of empathy is you're experiencing what other people are experiencing. But I also feel that at the end of the day, it's incredibly valuable, especially when you're trying something new and you are doing things more entrep- in a more entrepreneurial fashion is because you're trying to break through on something that hasn't been fixed. And there are all sorts of reasons why that might be the case, all sorts of barriers, all sorts of reasons that different stakeholders around a particular issue might have for you know, either reluctance, you know, active reluctance to work on it or just passive, you know, inability to work on it. And I think that empathy in these kinds of situations is so important for understanding motivations and understanding how to communicate effectively. So those are just a few of the things I would, I would offer um, in terms of some of the the qualities that I think are helpful. And so when you, if we can unpack empathy a little bit, what does that, can you like look on, like on a day-to-day level or in a given situation? Just so we're using that word so much now, and I just mm-hmm. want to be clear what that means to you. Mm. Um, I, first of all, Lynn, I think it's a great observation that we're using that word so much now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just what a welcome change that is because that was not the case a year ago. And I think that is something that COVID-19 has absolutely brought uh, into the spotlight is, is empathy and leadership. And so I'm really happy about, about seeing that. And, um, and it's something I you know realized about myself several, several years ago, actually, I remember that I was at this um, kind of convening and it was this, it was this, this conference of, you know, all sorts of different people, social entrepreneurs and change makers and, and others. And you had to use three words to describe yourself. And one of mine was empath, you know, and we got into a big discussion about it, you know, cause then you had to say what your words were and, and those kinds of things. And um, people were like, that's an, it, interesting. Okay. You know, kind of like it was a weird choice. And now <laughs> I feel like it would be like, Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. That's, that's a normal, you know, that that's a word. That's the word right now. And so to me, I think that empathy at its core is um, a willingness and and actually repeating a word I've used before and a curiosity Mm -hmm. about other people to understand what, where they're coming from, what they're thinking about, and then, and then applying that to how you then address a situation. Sometimes it's about, you know, modulating your reaction. Um, it's sometimes it's about, but I, but I also think that it's important to, um, to draw a distinction of, I, I don't think that empathy means not taking a position on things, right? I think it means that you can understand and you can see someone where they are and meet them where they are, but that also your ability to do that and to internalize it, but still put forth your point of view or your decision, if you know, in a leadership standpoint, in a clear way, but in a thoughtful way to them, I, I think it's very powerful because it allows you to show that you're taking in um, and and kind of honoring other people's experiences and opinions, um, but also able to say and and do from a place of deep credibility. I've heard you. I see you. This is my decision, and this is why. Right. Um, and I I I really feel um, like it's been a helpful quality uh, to to me at least. You know, um, I'm not saying it's the only quality or um, that that you have to operate that way, um, but I find it effective. Um, and I and I find it effective because particularly in the types of opportunities I've had. First of all, because I do, you were talking about purpose earlier, everything, you know, I've, I've always pursued opportunities where purpose was involved. They've been varied in terms of what the purpose was and and what was behind it. Um, But it's really important to me. And I feel like if you're working in an environment where a social mission is at the core, then empathy is very helpful, I think, and, and very 
important. And um, so I, I think that uh, it's it's just something that, you know, I've found very valuable um, and very helpful in terms of alignment, you know, leadership, my leadership style, wanting to make sure that my leadership style and who I am is aligning with the mission that we have, right? Kind of the idea of you can't say outwardly, here are all the ways in which we want to positively impact the world. And then internally, here are all of the not nice ways we're going to treat the people who work here, right? So I think that's one one piece of it. And I would also say, I think, um, to bridge back to the kind of entrepreneurial space that you were talking about, I also think that because empathy, part of empathy is curiosity, I think it's very helpful when you're operating in environments where you're trying to put pieces together and, you know, uh, come up with, with solutions and in new ways. I think this is so interesting. And, and as you know, I hadn't intended to get into empathy <clears throat> specifically, but as we're talking about it and I, and also I'm, I think this is a critical piece of leadership and, but I am asking myself, so for people that don't, think that that, they, that it's a nice thing not a not an important element you know how, how do we say what's the return on your investment about being empathetic it's it's mm. yeah that's a really interesting question i would say I mean, I obviously haven't studied this. So, I mean, when you ask me return on investment, I think, okay, well, how can I prove this? <laughs> so I can't prove this. Um, I mean, I, I think I think this is where it's going to be, you know, there's certainly articles um, and other things that are coming out now. And I think it'll be interesting to watch over the next three years or so watching, uh, you know, much has been made right around women leaders throughout the pandemic and their approach. Um, and how that has differed, right? Um, you know, certainly Jacinda Ardern is is one that's that's um, that's that's put out there, and I'm a big admirer of her. We could have a whole conversation about that, but so I think that there could be some interesting kind of ROI analyses that that could be happening, especially coming out of this period, which would be really interesting. But speaking from my own standpoint or what I've observed. I feel like what I would say to people is that I've seen empathy be very helpful in terms of investment and buy-in from your team. Mm. Because I think um, that it, when the team knows that you, you are following, not that you're getting in their business, right, or in their personal business, but that you're following, that you see them as a full person, that you want to understand what's, what's going on, and you want to um, incorporate that into your daily practice and, and your, the way that you approach leadership at the organization. I do think that it affects the tone and the culture of the organization and that it can lead to... Um, you know, happiness and, uh, and not just happiness, right? Because nobody's ever fully happy at it, right? There are hard parts of jobs and that's fine. In my opinion, there should be, um, but that there's satisfaction maybe is a better word than, than happiness and, and a comfort level that there are going to be ups and downs in this job as there are in any job, but that there is a sense of, um, security and um, stability in terms of what is built within that culture of a respect for each other and empathy for, for what others are going through. And I think this past year, you know, that has made this more important than ever, right. Of being able to, because I think that empathy also gives a resilience um, to, and I think that's the other thing I would say from an ROI perspective is that I think it can, help you be more resilient and and adjust when there are shocks to the system. Nobody saw this coming over the last year. And I think that empathy um, for managers and leaders has probably really helped them navigate leading through COVID-19, as well as has helped their team feel supported as they navigate COVID-19. Thank you. That was so many things that you've said there are sparking other things in my mind. Um, and I, and there is research out, you know, out there showing how empathy 
um, and creating that kind of culture and those values, people feel have psychological safety and they're willing to take more risks and they, you know, feel more engaged and all of those um, benefits. It is, and I like also the curiosity with empathy. I like that you have made them like twin sisters or <laughs> curiosity sits inside empathy. Um, because cur- when you bring with, when you start with curiosity, when you come with curiosity, then you can do what you have done, Emily, create new things and go into other where no one's gone before. Um, so we should, let's have another conversation at some point about curiosity, because that's another, uh, like empathy, we use it a lot, but what is it? You know, what are we talking about and how do we mm-hmm. keep, it, keep it with us all the time mm-hmm. and not, default and maybe i'm just t- speaking of myself but default to what i think i know is the right thing <laughs> right thing to do because i usually do know what the right thing is to do <laughs> <laughs> well and i think you know I, I i would would definitely not argue that this is the only way to um to to keep and maintain curiosity throughout a career but i i would observe um as a working mother that I feel like having young children Mm -hmm. has been an amazing aid to my own ability to, um, to be curious. Right. And I was actually just saying to on email to a friend um, the other day that it's really incredible, you know, not only the things that children teach you, but the things that they reteach you about anything under the sun, right. About let's take the sun, right. The things they teach you about the sun and the solar system that you completely forgot. Right. Or, you know, coming home and, and reminding me things about Maya Angelou that I had forgotten. And I mean, from any subject, that ability, and then the desire that children have to go deeper into a subject and understand what's behind it. And, oh my gosh, the social justice souls that they all just naturally have. It's just there as a part of them, as these kind of beautiful little beings, right? The, those things are so powerful in them. And, and, I, and I actually feel like even though there are times that it's very hard and certainly over the last year where it's very hard to lead while also leading a family. On the other hand, that curiosity and that the soul that they bring to me, I think really gives me the strength, right? To keep asking those questions and to have that patience to ask more questions and dig deeper and find something out if I don't know the answer to it and, and all of those things. So I would just offer that also for the working parent listeners out there. Well, it's just, a, I'm sure the other working parents have thought of this. It is a reminder of like, this, these are hard times having the children home. And, you know, this is one of the benefits of having the children home. And I think maybe I should have a podcast with your children. <laughs> we, could, we could talk about stuff that I've forgotten to ask questions about. So, so many things. I, I was on a, um, a call um, recently where uh, my, my younger child, um, my kindergartner, she, she came in and was crying, I mean, bawling, really, really crying. Um, And, you know, comes around on on the videos on a Zoom call and sits on my lap and just sobbing face red, you know, you know, my brother punched me in the face and, you know, my children are are lovely, but, you know, they're siblings and they they fight sometimes. Um, And she was really upset. So I said, you can just sit with me and do what you need to do. And, you know, this is just part of of, of the situation now. And so she kind of sat there and kind of quietly cried <laughs> to herself for a few minutes. And then just out of the blue, you know, turns to me and, and the person I was speaking to and says, Lana Banana had her baby goats today. <laughs> Lana Banana is a goat they have at, at her school, um, which is amazing. They have goats at her school, but, you know, just within two minutes, just, oh, let me tell you about these goats, right? And so it's just these, <laughs> these things that, uh, that these conversations that you have uh, when you actually have children in the workspace <laughs> are really different. And so what I also like about that story is she, she moved on. She didn't keep ruminating about her brother punch her in the face. She was like, okay, done with that, move on. Another thing to learn from children. 
Yes, definitely. And just to wrap up, Emily, if you had could give advice to your younger self, mm-hmm. what advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. I would say one of the things would be stay curious mm-hmm. always. Um, that that's a sometimes I think that curiosity. Curiosity always feels good, but I also think that curiosity in a career, especially when you're young, can feel like you're aimless, right? Like you're curious because you can't figure out what you want to do and that that's a bad thing. Um, And I think it's not a bad thing, right? I think that there are very few people who know exactly what they want to do. And I, and I used to definitely envy, envy that of people who knew, Oh, I want this and I'm going to follow it and I'm going to achieve it. And I mean, I think that's great that, that they have, but that wasn't me. And, um, and I think that curiosity, you know, in when you're young can feel, um, can feel dangerously close to, Ooh, it's because I don't know what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And I think when you're feeling that way, stop yourself see if what you're doing is something that you are enjoying doing and, 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 and relishing in some way and that you are still curious about, right? And if some of those boxes are ticked, then you're fine and let life develop as it will. Um, so I think that's one thing I would, I, would, I would say to young leaders. I think another thing I would say is, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes And that, you know, we talk about failure and I think that um, failure is, is this word that has both good and bad connotations. I think in our industry, people are, you know, talking more about failure being, being good and, you know, not always looking at as bad, which I, which I think is is great and, and really productive. But I think it's maybe another way of thinking about mistakes and failure is just a commitment to learning, right? That it's really about learning. Failure, after all, and mistakes are are one of our best teachers. And so I think kind of going alongside with that maintaining curiosity is just maintaining the willingness to learn mm-hmm. and being open about that with, um, with people. I think the other thing I would say, and Lynn, this is something you and I talked about before, and I know you were kind of interested in, was, you know, I think that especially if you are... Um, as a young person wanting to go into, you know, a leadership position, you want to be an executive director, you want to be a CEO, you might be kind of topic agnostic, but you're really interested in leadership. I feel like one thing um, that I wasn't prepared for that I wish I would have kind of understood and, and maybe thought about and sat with a little bit as a young professional would have been that it's my experience that leadership can be lonely and that that's okay, um, but that it's something that you need to kind of understand um, and 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 examine a bit um, in terms of that you you don't have a, a peer right when you're in a leadership position. You have so many partners, right? You have wonderful people around you, but in terms of your organization, you ultimately have to make those decisions. And sometimes they're very hard decisions and they're painful decisions. Um, And at the end of the day, it does come down to you. And so you have to get kind of comfortable with that fact and with that idea of sometimes that's going to be kind of lonely. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, I just feel like that's something that I wish I would have thought about a little bit and been aware of um, as I went into it. Not that it would have prevented um, my desire, you know, to, to, to be a leader or kind of the things about me, like we talked about at the beginning that say, why not and raise my hand. Um, But it is something that I think if people can be intentional about and kind of know that, then it helps them build up their own resilience, right. In terms of capacity um, to be a leader. Uh, I, I think it's just something that could be helpful for young leaders to know. And I'm so glad that you brought that in. And I think knowing ahead of time that it is lonely as part of it is not to say, no, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to be lonely, but you build your resilience up ahead of time. You go in armored up, so to speak. I don't know if that's the right, a good metaphor, but you, you're not surprised. You're not gobsmacked when you realize that you are feeling lonely. So I, I appreciate you bringing that, bringing that forward. So, Emily, thank you so much for your time today, um, for sharing your stories and for your 
insights and it feels to me like you came with your heart and your authenticity. So thank you for that. Oh, absolutely. It was really a pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I hope it's helpful to those who are listening. And, and Lynn, I really appreciate that you've built this space um, for, for not only for leaders to, I think it's really helpful to be asked questions from a leadership standpoint, right? Because it maybe makes you from a leader perspective, realize things about yourself <laughs> and be introspective, right? Like that commitment to learning uh, about yourself and, 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 and as a leader and examine things that maybe you could do better or, um, or you could double down on. So I think it's really helpful to have these kinds of conversations, right? I don't look at this as, you know, imparting, uh, imparting information or dare I say wisdom in a one way direction, right? It's really a two way, um, a two way process that, that, um, that I'm learning a lot from. So I appreciate the space. Good. Thank you so much. And everyone see you the next time. 